so today what we're doing is we're fast forwarding five years and the, the honest answer to these questions, like there's all of these fun ones, right? I mean, the politics one, that's fun. All of these are really interesting things. The other side of you that's also true, right? If you're gonna be really honest, there are things like in the world that you hope aren't a part of your life in the next five years. Wordle, whatever that is, that's a great thing. Like NFTs, that's hilarious. All of these things like around us that we hope maybe aren't around. The other truth of the matter is, <clears throat> if we're really honest, we're gonna just jump in quick. There's also parts of you uh, that you kind of hope aren't around in five years too, right? Like some of you, if you're really honest with yourself, like there's parts of you that you just wish were a little bit different. And when you fast forward five years from now, you hope that the things that are kind of dark, the things that kind of trip you up, the things that are temptations in your life, the things that kind of bring you down, the things that like, you know, all of those, those things that you wish they weren't there. In the next five years, you kind of wish that you could just leave them behind, right? And the truth is, like, there's a lot of things that you can do to make sure that you do leave those things behind. Some of you, it's like a discipline thing. We talked about that early on through the series. We talked about, like, setting goals and setting, like, who you're going to become kind of goals throughout your life. And then today, what we're doing is we're kind of picking up where we left off last week when it comes to purity, integrity, those kinds of things, and saying, hey, there's parts of ourselves that can kind of vision cast for the future about what we hope to be true, but then there's also a part of us that if we could kind of look at our lives, just wish that we didn't bring those things with us, right? And some of you, if you're really honest, you've been bringing things with you for like years and years and years and years, right? So we're going to be honest for a second. You were honest about the fun ones. Like, let's be a little bit honest about the serious ones, all right? Let's do this. How many of you, if you're really honest, this past year, you were hurt by somebody that you haven't fully forgiven yet? Is there anybody in the room that would agree with, with me on that? I'm, I'm like that, Yeah. Right Now, we talked about this a minute ago, and I think this is really good. How many of us like financially wish that where we are right now in some of our decision-making, that we wish that we were making some different decisions five years from now when it comes to finance? So go ahead and raise your hand if you're like that. That, that would be us, too. Like, I, I agree with that, right? How many of you, if you're going to be really honest, now, come on, if you're, if you're really honest, some of you, like, you carry, like, a low-grade anger with you throughout your week or day, right? Now, we're on this together. I'm going to raise my hand just to go ahead and let you know we're in this together. Like, there's a low-grade just angst, anger, something that you carry with you that you haven't figured out how to fully let go of. How many of you, you carry with you, like, a low-grade sort of, like, sadness or fear with you pretty consistently throughout your day? Right. How many of you have raised your hands for almost all of those like I have, you know? But there's parts of your life that you like. There are parts of your life that you wish you could kind of repackage and restructure. And there's parts of your life that you just wish that you could just put aside. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but how many of you, like, if you were really honest with yourself, don't raise your hand. But if you're like, hey, there's like addictions that I currently have that just like have a grip on me that I haven't fully let go of yet. Or maybe there's a tension with you and your spouse that you just, you just carry it over and over and over, year after year after year, and you've talked about it, but you've never resolved it. You've never really made progress. It just kind of exists where you are. Some of you, it comes to your job, too. And if you're really honest, like, with the way that you approach your job, the way that you look at it, like, you just go, I feel like I've hit a ceiling. I don't even know how to break through that thing. And it's because you're carrying certain things with you in your leadership and the ways that you interact with people. There's certain things that are just almost, like, attached to you that you haven't figured out how to, like, detach from. Now, I'll be really honest with you, and I don't do this all, uh, very often, but I had a completely different message uh, as of 11.30 last night. And then at 11.30 last night, I'm sitting looking at my computer, uh, and I'm going, what I really wish that I could convince you of actually feels like kind of countercultural to wrap up a series with. Typically, you like end a series, and everybody's like, and we were so happy, so we can come back the next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? But today, I want to like, I want to go in a little bit further than we did last week on the things that I think you should maybe try to work to leave behind. And for many of us in the room, if you're really honest, like there's parts of your life that you've just stopped trying to move forward in because you've spent so many years stuck in a cycle of not being able to move past it, right? And there's so many things that could get wrapped up into this. One of the things that I talk about, we talk about a lot around here, is like your faith journey is a part of that too. 
I was on uh, Twitter this morning, and I was reading through it, and somebody talked about this. I thought it was so fascinating. They were like, one of the things, I said this on the tweet, one of the things that I hope to leave behind is the church and all of corporate Christianity, which I thought was so fascinating because and everybody's like, yeah, da, 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 da. and some of you feel that as well. You like stumbled in here. Somebody invited you and you felt like you had to come or there was free lunch on the other side of it. But there's a part of you that goes like, I want to leave all of that stuff behind too. Some of you walked away from faith in every practical sense. There's something about your life that still thinks there's something out there. But you are just kind of convinced that you're not going to know what it is, and you're certainly not going to know what it is through a group of people who call themselves the local church. And I get, I get all of that. And so today what I want to do is I want to, like, I want to poke at those things that deep down you wish that you could leave behind. But I don't just want to poke at that. I want to get after, like, the heart of it. And so today is going to be practical in some parts. And then today what I'm going to do is I hope if I could say this well, I, I hope that we could take like your heart and your life and your spirituality and figure out a way where you could form it and reform it in a way where when you get five years from now, there's not a massive list of things that you want to leave behind. There's a, there's, a, there's a list of things that Jesus did in your heart to allow you to leave those things behind years before. All right. And here's the, the really kind of the truth for me in all of this. There's a certain amount of this work that you can do and should do. And then there's a piece of this work that actually begins at the place that we're going to talk about today. And I think until you get this piece of the puzzle or this part of the, like the solution, everything else in your efforts might be good and you might even make some progress, but you never fully and finally get on the other side of those things that I think God is probably calling many of us to leave behind. And so we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today. It's one of my favorite areas of the Bible. Now, it's called Colossians. It's written by a guy named Paul. We talk about Paul a lot. Uh, Paul re- wrote about half the New Testament. He's extraordinary for so many different reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons I think he's so extraordinary is he's very intellectual, uh, and he's very practical in the ways that he talks about things. And then he zooms out, and he almost gets after both like the practical steps and then the heart behind all of it. And so when it comes to these things that you wish that you could leave behind when you fast forward for five years, what Paul says thousands of years ago is super applicable to the way that we look at it now. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 to start out with. Uh, Here's what Paul says. He's writing to a group of people who are obviously different than you, but in some ways similar in the ways that they approach spirituality. Here's what he says. He says, your whole self was ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now, you didn't expect me to say circumcised out loud, but here we go. Uh, what this meant was this was like a, a spiritual like, ritual that this uh, group of Jewish people would have in particular done uh, as part of their like, religious experience. And so when he talks about circumcision, we'll talk about this throughout uh, and what he means by it. But he says, we're circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, what what Paul is going to get after, and this is kind of the foundational piece of this, is he's going to get after what this looks like, what this looks like for you to like, to experience the fullness of what Jesus did on your behalf, specifically as it pertains to your behaviors and the ways that you experience the world. All right, let's go two slides ahead, if we can, Grant. Let's go one more slide ahead. We'll come back to that one in a second. He says this. He said, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ, and he forgave us all our sins, right? Now, this is one of those things that's kind of weird to talk about in church. In fact, I was joking with somebody about it earlier because it's kind of funny. Sometimes you grow up in churches that come at you when it comes to sin, and it's constantly like this. Like, you shouldn't do it. Don't do the thing. Don't do the thing. Don't do the thing. It's like constantly like this. In fact, you've been around people who made you feel less than constantly for decisions that you have made or were making. But when Paul is talking about sin, he's not just talking about things that you either checked off or, or checked wrong. He's not, he's not doing that. It's not a pass or fail for him. When Paul talks about sin, it's about breaking the heart of God and then breaking relationship with people who are in the world. Sin is deeply connected both vertically to the way we experience God, but also horizontally to the way that we experience everyone else. And Paul's assumption is that every single one of us at some point or another We'll, we'll break that connection in one of those two ways, and most of us do it on a pretty consistent basis. And so what he's saying is you are dead in your sins, meaning that those things, those broken parts of your relationships or your interactions with God 
made your experience in life less than it could have been. And then he talks about how Jesus came and through his death and resurrection forgave all of us for those things. And then he goes on and he says this, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, this is where Paul gets so fascinating. It gets a little bit brave heart or gladiator kind of quick. Like it gets kind of violent through this. And I'll explain why I think that's the case in a second. But what Paul starts talking about is those things that have gripped us and disconnected us from people and the way that the world should be and also disconnected us from our relationship with God. He's saying the triumph over all of that wasn't in our own doing. It wasn't in our own power. It wasn't in our own ability to muster up whatever it is that we got to muster up to make sure that we were right with everyone and right with God because we broke that. And he's saying with that, because of the way that the world's set up, and you know this already, that there's like consequences to all of that. And Jesus comes in and he lives this life and he dies on the cross. And then Paul gives this visual. It's like when Jesus died on this cross, he took all of our brokenness and the brokenness that we created in the world and he took it all on the cross with him as if it was nailed to the cross with him. And it's through that that we were able to be made right with God. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, this is one of my favorite verses, and I'll tell you why. If you're not a follower of Jesus, and at least you get to look at this and go, man, that's, that's pretty cool, right? You read this, and I read this in 2022 and go, that's just really cute phrasing. Like, that's great. But the, the, the visual images that Paul is drawing from in this ancient Roman empire is extraordinarily violent with what he's teaching. He positions Jesus as the conqueror over everything that has broken you and broken the world. And he positioned him as conqueror. Now, now look at this. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, the public spectacle thing is where it gets real fun. The public spectacle thing is almost like this cross-reference with how an emperor would come back into the city after having conquered another area or region in the world. The way that the emperor would come back in, I don't miss this, he would come back in kind of going in front and to celebration, but behind him dragging the bodies of people that they had conquered in that. And it gets dark and weird and hard. And you're going like, that's a really weird bedtime story, Paul. Like, and they would have read this in front of a group of people. And the public spectacle nature of this is what makes it so odd. Because it feels a little bit arrogant. And it feels like, why do you got to go that far? And why do you got to pull those images to it? And I think the reason that Paul did is because what Paul is communicating isn't minor authority that's attributed to Jesus to break the things that have broken us. But he communicates total authority, this total sense of conquering. And then later on throughout the New Testament, what we, what we find in the New Testament, is the writer of the New Testament say the same power that was in Jesus to overcome the brokenness of sin also lives in those who are followers of him. In fact, Paul would kind of outline this theology around when you come to faith in Jesus, the power in you to be a part of of untethering yourself from those things that have, have kind of kept you connected and tethered to yourself, that power lives within you because it lived within Jesus and he gives us that freedom. Now, I didn't fully kind of grasp this until we had kids. And the more that I thought about this and where we're gonna go in a second with what Paul says, The public spectacle thing was always really cool. If you're Braveheart, kind of whatever action fan, whatever, that's an interesting history and stuff. But it didn't make sense to me until uh, somebody one time said something about my son and they like made fun of him in front of other people. This is interesting to me. And I don't know what you're like, but as a parent, and I'm an Enneagram 8, so we'll just acknowledge I'm more broken than everybody in the room, right? And there was something in me where I looked at him and he just like, he just like kind of withered up and was embarrassed and like both sad and, and felt shame. It was one of the first times I go like he felt shame in public. And the thing that was in me 
was wanting to look at him and solve that problem and let him know how loved he was no matter what. And as I thought about that, I thought I would go to any length possible to publicly show him that he is fully loved, fully accepted, because he's my son. And the the power of this verse isn't the fact that God is just conquering things. And it's not in the fact that Paul pulls this language to go, and, and Jesus had the power to do for us that we can never do for ourselves, even though that's amazing and awe-inspiring and powerful. It's that Jesus put a public spectacle on to communicate just how much he wants you to be untethered from the things that have tethered themselves to you. And you know how you show that? Is you show it in a grand sort of way, right? Real quick, those of you who proposed in the room, right? There's a part of you, whether you did it or not, at least in 1990 or 2000s or whatever, that kind of wanted to make a little bit of a spectacle of it, right? How many of you have ever seen like an engagement video where you're like, that was both a lot of money and wow, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because in the name of love, you know, like you just you show out on that stuff, which is super cool. Why? Because there's a, there's, a, there's a public spectacle nature of saying, whatever it takes for you to know, I want you to know. And Paul, in this writing, is going, it's like Jesus took all of the brokenness in the world, and he conquered it all, and he threw it all behind him, and he comes into the city like an emperor and a king, saying, look what I did for you. So that you can be made right with God. And then it's, it's from that, and we get these writings in the Testament, it's from that that goes, that same power is in us, and our obedience to the way of Jesus is connected deeply to the power of Jesus within us. I put it in my notes, I said this. For us, obedience becomes like a decision. You are not controlled by what controlled you in the past. You are not controlled by the shame that you've experienced in the past. You are not controlled by the identity things that have gripped you in the past. You are not controlled by your own failures in the present or the past or in the future. You are not controlled by those things. What Scripture teaches us is that as followers of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit moving through us gives us strength to move forward in powerful ways. But our mind has to say this way, the power to obey has been given to us because Jesus made a way. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have work to do. You have so much work to do. You have so much inward forming and reforming and shaping and reshaping and inviting the right people in and getting counseling and getting help, all these sorts of things. But it starts with you recognizing that the thing that you most need as a follower of Jesus is in you because of what Jesus did. And then later on in chapter 3, he, again, kind of zooms out and he says it this way. He says, here's the thing to do. He says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. He said, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God, meaning that, that when he came, you give your life fully to him. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And whatever this thing is that is eternal, you will be a part of that thing. And then he gives a specific thing to do, and he goes back to the violence language, and it gets a little wonky, and he says this, and then he says, put to death. Now, in the Greek, in the original language that this is written, I want to put this up here. Let's put up the, let's go to the next one too. We'll, We'll show you this. I love this. The Greek word here literally just means to slay, which I love that word. It's not like we got in a fight and I just killed the thing. No, 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 no. It's not like I stomped on a bug. You know, no, 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 no. I slayed that spider. You know what I mean? Like, like I went after it. I was passionate about focusing in and putting that thing to exist no more, to slay it. And then he gives a list of the things in our lives that we, through the power of God's spirit, move forward in, in slaying with our lives. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he talks about like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And this is where it gets so fascinating. When Jesus teaches on the Sermon on the Mount, when he takes all of these things that Paul would eventually list, 
it's not just about the act of them. It's about the mind and the heart and the spirit of all of it because it's all deeply connected. He says, put to death the things that have attached themselves to your heart and your mind and your life. And then he says, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, which these kind of make up the way that we break relationship with other people in the world. The first set sort of ends up breaking some of of our heart and and causing connections and untether or tetheredness that that we have to carry from that. This ends up being like how we relationally respond to other people. He says, also rid yourselves of such things such as anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips saying all of those things that end up like breaking relationship that you have with other people, then you work through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to slay all of it. But that power rests in you. And then he goes back to the relational side. He says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, the image of its creator. Meaning that as you slay these things in your life, you discover and experience and sense the way that creation was supposed to be. Then he goes like professor deep theology, and we'll talk about it real quick. He says this, he says, and here there is no Gentile or Jew. And then he goes through this list. He says, but Christ is all and is in all. In every part of society, in every part of a person, in every human being, that Christ brings us together and he is all and he is in all of it. And then for those who have decided to follow Jesus, he casts vision around what this is actually to be. And he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, and in the word, holy. As God's chosen people and those who engage in a way where they slay the things that have tethered them to brokenness. He says, holy. And then he says, dearly loved. As if the holiness and the pursuit of living a life where you are untethered by those things is deeply connected by your identity as a human who is loved and that Jesus came for and he died for. And he said, clothe yourselves or wrap yourselves fully with compassion and with kindness and with humility and gentleness and patience, which is every comment section on Facebook. Wrap yourself in a position where you are humble and experience the world where you're centered and you're not pulled in every direction based off of what is happening, but you move through the world with full knowledge of whose you are and it shapes everything else that you do. And then he gets after probably one of the the most difficult parts of the whole thing. And I asked this question earlier Um, And if we're really honest, some of you raised your hand. Most of us in the room could raise our hands to this one. And I love that he kind kind of wraps this section with this. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone. And then he says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And this, this is kind of like the, oh. That you work to untether your heart from the pain that other people caused you. Because God has forgiven you. That no matter what amount of pain someone else has done to you, no matter what amount of wrongdoing that has been done to you, that you have likely been forgiven more. Now, this is one of the things that I I love talking about. Because as followers of Jesus, this is one of the hardest things for many people. Right? This is like... This is one of the things that people who are not followers of Jesus would actually talk about as being a thing that followers of Jesus struggle with the most, which is so odd in the, in the context of these passages and Christianity in general, because as people who have been forgiven much, why is it so difficult for us to extend the same forgiveness in other places? And that doesn't mean that you forget, and it doesn't mean that you don't set up healthy boundaries, and it doesn't mean that you don't move through the world in a healthy way, but, but at the end of the day, why do we allow ourselves to be so deeply tethered to things that other people did to us. And we don't extend forgiveness. Some of you, come on, if you're really honest, and again, you 
might not say this out loud, but some of you, you hold like bitterness and pain and unforgiveness towards God. That you haven't forgiven God for not showing up or intervening in a way that you thought that he should. And as much as this directionally happens with people who are like horizontal in nature, come on, this, the real part of being a human is also going, and it also in some ways goes vertically. Now, it sounds weird to talk about like forgiving God because he's perfect, but from our perspective and what we desire and our expectations, often unmet expectations, there's a piece of us that goes, you should have done this and you didn't. I felt like you promised me this and silence. God, you should have this. And at some point along the way, it's going, there's a set of unmet expectations that I have vertically towards you. And I, I have to extend whatever, at least in my perception is forgiveness that way, and to go, God, what is it that you want to do, even if it's not what I think should be done? Then he goes on and he says this, and over all these things or all these virtues, you put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And this, this is the picture of God's people. A group of people who pursue holiness to an extent where it's deeply uncomfortable. And a group of people who experience forgiveness in ways that are deeply uncomfortable. And a group of people, come on, don't don't miss this, who believe so powerfully in the resurrection of Jesus and also the way that the resurrection explodes from us into every part of our lives and how God, through us, resurrects broken relationships and broken things. And the mark of those who are deeply followers of Jesus, deeply centered in the way of Jesus, are people who are not afraid to go. There is a beyond natural power that rests in you to help you untether yourselves from the things that tether you. One of my favorite writers uh, is a guy named Eugene Peterson. Uh, Eugene Peterson passed away a few years ago. There's a great biography on him, which is, I love this, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're, or maybe you're someone who's been deconstructing for a while. You, you find in this brilliant writer, uh, this brilliant theologian, a, a person who experiences ups and downs and pain and sin and deeply the whole thing. In fact, if you've ever read the message version of the Bible, it's my, it's my boy Eugene. Now, I get to say my boy. Never met him. He would, but still, you know, my boy Eugene, who put that together in the midst of pain and suffering and marriage struggle and all of it together. And the way that he describes the life of a person who's a follower of Jesus is a phrase that the first time I heard it stuck with me. He says, it's a long obedience in the same direction, which is what this is. It's the pursuit of holiness empowered by the supernatural working of Jesus. It's the pursuit of loving other people even when they hurt you. It's the pursuit of of bringing together the collective nature of good that is the body of Christ to do good things and to experience the world in a powerful way. And the long obedience in the same direction it's a, lot, it's a lot like Bob Dylan records for me. Do we have any Bob Dylan fans in the room real quick? Do we have just, yeah, oh, come on, people. That's your homework this week. Go listen to some Bob Dylan, right? I love this, right? People talk about his albums and all of sort of his, like, collection of works over the many, many years. And if you were to look at any sort of, like, zoomed-in point of a Bob Dylan record, you could either think he was the most successful musician of all time or that he should be playing coffee shops in the middle of nowhere and no one should know his name, right? In fact, as you look at it, it almost feels like this kind of like up and down. It almost feels like a, a heart monitor in some ways, or like the success of some of these things. But it's moving together in one direction. And the collective work of Bob Dylan is phenomenal. Don't at me, right? It's incredible. So when you, when you think about this, it's, it's like a movement in one direction, and the ups and downs and every bit of the success and failure and all of it, but it all goes in the same direction and the collective nature of all of it is beautiful. Now, 
This is what hit me last night, and this is why we're talking about this today. And uh, this is why I wanted to go kind of a deeper dive into this kind of talk, specifically around sin. Is in our culture in Western Christianity, I think, it is so easy to be so practical and give you seven things on the seven things that you should do this week, and then the three things to remember, and all of those are good, and you should. But the formation of your heart and the formation of your Christian life is one where holiness in and of itself isn't simply an empowerment for you to be a better human. In fact, I don't, I don't think that's the end goal for this. The, the, the goal for you as an individual, not collective, but as an individual, isn't that you check all the boxes and believe all the right things and do all the right things and are just a really good suburban person, you know? Thank you. I thought it was funny too. <laughs> I was pretty proud of that one. I like that one. I was like, yeah. like me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like me, right? It's not. You're already a good person. You are. You're good. You're great. And it's not even that you do so many good things, even though you should and you will. It's that you find a way to untether yourself from the things that keep you from deep communion with the God of the universe who is pursuing not just everybody, but pursuing you as a person. And not an abstract being, not just a like distant out there kind of thing that I can't quite, whatever, but the person of God pursuing the person that is you and the fullness of your heart. Now, I was, I genuinely believe this, one of the luckiest people in the world. Um, Because I grew up in a home with just me and my mom where the view of God that I was handed was actually birthed out of something that I was lacking. A lot of you know this, I grew up in a single parent home, it's always just me and my mom. And so from the time that I was a kid, she just talked about God as Heavenly Father. And she would point to passages like where, where Jesus would address God as Father. And she would talk about, like, how do you pray? You pray like this, you know, and talk about Father. And one of the best examples of this um, is, is uh, an experience that I had as a kid. Um, we had just moved to a brand new city, and uh, I, was, I was trying out for coaches pitch baseball. Do you remember, remember these days when, you know, speaking of tight pants, uh, that was, you know, me. We were playing baseball. And T-ball days for me were sitting in the outfield taking dandelions and making them look like Batman. Like, so I was not, nobody thought I was going to be a ball player, you know, at the time. And so we moved to this new city, and we, we go to this tryout. And if you can imagine this the best that you can, there's this massive sort of hill that overlooks, like, 20 of these baseball fields, right? All these baseball fields. And so we pulled up. I don't know if any of you remember this. Any of my uh, kids from the 90s, real quick. Anybody remember the Astrovan? Do we have any Astrovan fans in the room? Can we put that up real quick, the Astrovan? Anybody remember these? Anybody, anybody have one of these at some point or another? It's a shagging wagon, baby. It's an amazing Astro van, right? It's incredible. We were just talking about why do they have blinds? Like, why do you put blinds in a van? It's just weird. Don't answer that question out loud. But anyway, so we had this Astro van. I kid you not, we, we got there. I had like a little Sega or whatever in the back. And, and so I pull up. And it's, I don't know, I had to be seven or years old. <clears throat> we pull up, and it overlooks the whole field. And every other kid, at least in my perspective, had a dad out there, and they're all playing catch, and this is like a moment for everybody. And I'm like, Mom, I love you and your 80s hair, but I do not want you to go down there and, you know, try to be anything that you're not, which is a man playing baseball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so we're in the van, and she paused, and with just so much wisdom, here's what she did when I was a kid. <clears throat> and this is how we talked about everything. She looks at me, and she goes, you know, you feel like you're probably walking down there alone. She goes, but you have a heavenly father who cares about every part of your life, including, including this baseball trial. And I remember it, and she sits there and she prays with me. And in some ways it felt, you know, as a, even as a kid, it felt cheesy. And then I get out of the van and I walk down there. But at the same time, if you actually believe that God cares about the things that you care about, he's invested in your life, he cared about this thing which brings like a whole new meaning to like my dad could beat up your dad kind of scenarios, right? Like it's pretty amazing. Like, and I remember going on that field and I remember thinking God cares about this thing. And as a seven-year-old, feeling like communion with God 
in the ways that I approach him. Not as a distant, out there, over there sort of thing, but as, as God who cares about me as a perfect father in my life. Now, I'll tell you this. Let's go to the next one. I want you to think about this one in terms of father. Now, the other thing about this is for many of us, you grew up in homes where you either didn't have a dad or the idea of a heavenly father just felt distant or abstract or sort of thing. Uh, or you're angry at your father, so it's, it's kind of a hard metaphor to think about. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray to a God who's present and who's father. And when you look through the New Testament, what we find in a lot of interactions is just this, this power of a God who's connected and his father. And when you look over the course of how these people lived and the ways that they describe how we should live in the world, what you find isn't that you end up being a great person, though you should be a great person. Is that the greatest joy of your life is that you have deep communion with the God of the universe. So, years and years and years later, I was trying to figure out, how do you talk about this and how do you, like, illustrate this. And I saw a movie. Has anybody ever seen the movie About Time? Has anybody ever seen the movie About Time? If you haven't seen it, you should go home and watch that movie like today. It's pretty great. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'm about to ruin it for you, so it'll be great together. Um, <laughs> the end of the movie is this. You have a father and a son. I thought this is so fascinating. And you see them like on the beach. And here's what always took me back by this scene, which I thought was so fascinating. Is at the end, when you have, when you're a kid, there's a point in your life where you're just innocent. And you're actually not tethered and connected to all the things that have hurt you at this point in life. And you're not a skeptic at this point. And you're not angry at the world. And you're not looking at every piece of it going, well, it's not right. You haven't been fooled at this point in life. You are innocent. And it doesn't mean that you're naive. It doesn't mean that you don't know or don't have the capacity to know. What this actually means is that you are innocent from the things that often attach themselves to us, that convince us that we don't have the capacity to experience what God has called us to experience. And I'll tell you, you can be a great person and you can know a lot of theology and you can move through your life and be really good. And you could end your life and people could come up and do this, you know, all those things. And miss the one thing that I think God most desires for you and for me. And that's a deep personal relationship with him. Not forced, not naive, not void of your pain, not disconnected from those things. But a relationship with him. And I'll tell you this, if you're in the middle of any of the things that we've talked about today around holiness... The reason that the New Testament talks so much about holiness isn't just so that you're a good person. It's just so you don't do to yourself what causes you to disconnect from experiencing the fullness of God. Living a life of holiness or in that direction just removes or untethers you from the ability to experience God and hear from him, which I think is what he wants most from us. And so when you get five years from now, I'll tell you, this is my hope for you and my hope for me and my hope for us collectively as a church. You're going to do a lot of great things and you're going to do a lot of right things and you're going to be a great person you are. And I hope that every step of that journey over the next five years, the person that you are five years from now is not just a better human, but a person who deeply connects with the God of the universe who wants all of you. And so this is what I put in my notes, and this is where we'll kind of wrap up, and that's this. What I hope for you is that you tether yourself to Jesus. And through this process that we talked about, the Holy Spirit empowering you, and then doing the work that you need to do, that you would untether yourself from anything else that gets in the way of you experiencing that relationship with your Heavenly Father. Now, to wrap up our time, uh, I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come on up. Uh, we're going to end today with a a newer song to kind of outline some of the stuff that we've talked about. Um, but to wrap up kind of our series and the time together, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you just the opportunity just to respond to this. Uh, many of us are connected or find ourselves tethered to things that we wish that we weren't tethered to. And, uh, and the way that we're going to do that, 
It kind of feels uh, interesting in church because you've probably seen it done in weird ways or possibly even abused in church, and we're not going to do that together. Um, but I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond because there is something about just acknowledging something that almost puts you at the starting line and ready to kind of go, right? And so to do that, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask everybody in the room, if you would, just to close your eyes for a second, and I'm going to ask you to bow your head so that you don't really have the capability just to look around. I'm going to ask you to, to do that. And without, like, any music or without any, like, background, it's just silence. It's just us as a community and a family. There's a part of you that goes, you know what? There are things that I find myself tethered to that are in the way of me experiencing the fullness of a relationship with God. I want us to acknowledge that together. And so we're just going to, we're going to kind of go down this. If you're in the room and for you that tethering is some form of a forgiveness thing, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to raise your hand, right? If that's you and you're like, there's a tethering that I have to somebody who I haven't forgiven yet. Right now, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand to acknowledge that sort of thing. Okay. For some of you, it's an addiction thing. And it's a part where you're going, you know what? This is just something that I've been addicted to for a really long time. And I don't know how to get my way out of it. And it's tethered your heart. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm just going to ask you just to kind of look at me right now. You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you to look at me. And just say, hey, there's like an addiction thing that I'm tethered to. Yeah? Okay. And this is the last one, and then we're going to do this song together. For some of you, it's a thing that's like connected deeply like to your spirituality and that you've just been hurt by the church or the people who said that they were acting in the name of God. And you just begin to unpack parts of your faith in that way. And what you find yourself left with, somebody recently told me, which I thought was so powerful, was like a pile of bricks off to the side, and I don't know how to rebuild it. And if that's you, and there's like a, all of that just feels tethered to your heart, and you're not sure what to do when it comes to your faith, but you know that you need to lean into it. I'm, I'm going to ask you to look at me now as well. Just look up. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sing this song together. And I'm going to ask you to verbally sing this chorus out as we get to it. And if you find yourself believing it or partially believing it or partially leaning into it, I'm going to ask you to sing it out in faith, believing that, that God can heal these things and that he can move you forward and that that empowerment to overcome these things is in you as well. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much that you are both here and you're everywhere and you're inside of us. God, we thank you that you love us so much to make a public spectacle of the brokenness that is in us and around us and the brokenness that we've caused and to take all of that on yourself to give us freedom. God, we thank you that the freedom isn't just so that we can be better even though we can be better, but it's that on the other side of that, we get to experience the beauty and the fullness of a relationship with you. And so Father, I, I ask that you would captivate us again with your presence. I ask for those of us in the room who have been disconnected from you for a long time, God, I ask that in the most tangible way possible that you would remind us of how close you are and you would bring us back to our first love, bring us back to innocence, not being naive, but an innocence in our thinking that approaches you like a child. And God, as we do that, I ask that you would reveal yourself as a heavenly father who's deeply invested and deeply cares for us. To Jesus' name we pray.